You are listening to Addressing Gettysburg. And hello, everybody. Welcome to Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. Today, we are sitting here with Jim Pangburn. Hello, Jim. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. It's uh, always great to have you on here. People like when you're on. And uh, Bob is also still gone. He's still on vacation uh, to Arizona. Mm -hmm. So lucky Bob. He's Mm -hmm. out there in the sun. Um, All right. So let's get right into this here. We've got uh, six or so questions that we're going to ask. SJB underscore 5114 is yet another listener who's making his debut on Ask a Gettysburg Guide, and he's got a controversial question. Were some of General Longstreet's decisions, such as possibly delaying attacks till late afternoon on day two and three, part of the reason for the defeat? You hear this a lot. People want to blame Longstreet for Lee's defeat. Everybody but Lee. We can't blame Lee. It's everybody else's fault. But one of the things that we're all, you know, that's... uh, we're always hearing about is, you know, Longstreet dragged his heels and he delayed and he, you know, but what do you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Matt, I've always thought that uh, Longstreet was, was a better general in the defensive than he was uh, as an offensive general. Okay. Uh, he got kind of mixed up on some of those roads east of Richmond during the Peninsula campaign. <clears throat> Second Manassas, you know, he's in a defensive position where they're attacking him and things worked out pretty well. Um, I don't know that we can say too much about the third day. Uh, and blame him too much. But um, I think the big criticism is the second day. Mm-hmm. And what people need to realize, yeah, uh, TAC didn't come off till 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, it gave Union reinforcements that hadn't already arrived time to get on the battlefield, uh, lengthen the Union lines for Sickles to get here and advance out to the Peach Orchard. Um, Longstreet was trying to move from his camps uh, about three miles west of Gettysburg, uh, not too far from where we are right now, along Marsh Creek, hmm. um, to a jump-off point <clears throat> opposite the Union left, not far from the Round Tops. And um, he came over a ridge um, and could see uh, the Round Tops over Seminary Ridge in the trees, and he realized that he could see those heights the Union Army would have Signal Corps personnel up there, and they would be able to see him. And the whole idea of arriving suddenly on the Union left and be able to launch an attack before they could react was kind of lost. So Longstreet decided to uh, engage in a counter march, which lasted, I think, almost almost a seven mile counter march. He's not ready to um, uh, launch his attack or seize his position at the Peach Orchard until about three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, when you when you're saying counter march, you're talking he was marching one way, and then when he realized he's visible, he has to march back on the path that he just marched on. Yeah, right out right out here over um, her ridge. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget the name of the ridge out there. Uh, it's near uh, Black Horse Tavern. Black Horse Tavern, yeah. Is that, is that Breams Hill? Yeah, it's yeah. Breams Hill. That's right. Okay. That's it. Thank okay. you. And uh, That's right over there. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this is that his artillery commander, Porter Alexander, found a way to kind of go behind some low, some a ridge and some low ground, come along um, Marsh Creek, and then pop out uh, further down toward where the Eisenhower Farm is today and then come out below the trees on Seminary Ridge and not be seen from Signal Corps guys on the round tops. Right. And Longstreet didn't listen to him. He did what you said, Matt. He turned around, and he just reversed course. But it took until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, something like seven hours, um, to come out uh, of what is today uh, Pumping Station Road opposite the Peach Orchard, about 600 yards west of it. Which is near where the Eisenhower Farm is today. Very close. Mm Mm-hmm. And the whole idea was to seize the Peach Orchard, the high ground there, put artillery there, and attack the Union left from the end. Well, in the time that it took him to get there, um, Sickles had arrived with his Union Third Corps, 10,000 guys. And they were supposed to extend the Union line down uh, Cemetery Ridge to Little Round Top. And, of course, Sickles disobeyed orders and moved all the way out to the Peach Orchard, which was the position that Longstreet was going to seize and put his artillery and launch his attack from. So it caused Longstreet to extend his line another mile to the south, uh, because they were told to find the end of the Union line, get beyond it, and attack the Union line from the end. And with Sickles in front of him, that many had to go further. Uh, already the Confederate line is longer than the Union line. The Union line, three miles long, you know, the fish hook we talk about mm-hmm. is three miles long. And the Confederate surrounding line is, is almost twice that length. So now Longstreet has got to, to extend his line another mile because Sickles left now, instead of being on Cemetery Ridge or a little round top, is now... Um, at Devil's Den, uh, just west of uh, Big Round Top. Right. So Longstreet, not only did he have to extend his line, further weakening the Confederate punching power, 
by extending his line a mile to the south, but it delayed the Confederate attack until 4.30 in the afternoon of the second day. Um, remember, back then, it got darker about an hour and 11 minutes before it does now. Okay. So if you so come now the, it's like around 9 o'clock when it gets dark. Uh, here. If here, you come in yeah. 2020, July 2nd, right. 9 o'clock, maybe a little bit later. You're 1863, it's, it's 7.30, it's getting dark. Ugh. So my point is, when you launch your attack at 4.30, you've only got three hours of daylight right, to, okay. to prosecute Yeah, attack. yeah. So, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I think what Longstreet was trying to do when he made the counter march is come in closer behind Seminary Ridge and use the trees of Seminary Ridge as concealment. He was further out when he went over Breams Hill and um, uh, could, be, could see and could be seen from the round tops better. Um, so he came in closer and used the tree line as cover, but the problem is uh, it took so long to get in position. Right. The, the biggest criticism I have is, you know, he's, he's trying to avoid detection, but, um, you know, Alexander insisted that he could get around with his artillery and did, and did, right. without being detected. Right. So that's the biggest real criticism. Is that he didn't listen to Alexander. Yeah. You know, there was a way, apparently, to get around there mm -hmm. without being seen and without engaging this unbelievably long counter march that he, he engaged in. Yeah. Um, so, so the, I mean, the, the, the Alexander, uh, path that, that he took was where did, do you, where did that go? Well, um, Longstreet would have been heading kind of in a southeasterly direction. Um, and just to his right along the ridge is where Alexander went. went kind so of he's kind of going off southwest-ish? Um, kind of west and then got to Marsh Creek and then turned and ran along the bank of the creek uh, south and then turned around and came back east to what is Black Horse Tavern Road today, I believe, um, but then further down underneath uh, the trees of Seminary Ridge where he couldn't be seen. Okay. If you know where, um, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, the author uh, who's... Shara. No. Oh. Um, German name. His son is involved now in uh, 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 creating uh, films. Uh, yeah, works for the college. A German name? Yeah. Um, uh, I can't think of his name right now. Very uh, famous. There's a bunch of books. His, his house is down along the creek where... Oh, okay. Where he poured his... Bore it. Gabber Bore it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, okay. Matt. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Gabber okay. Bore yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't think of the name. That's like a good name. You're blind. Right, right. Gabber Bore it. Yeah. Yeah. His, his house, at least it was a few years ago. Um, if you come off uh, Fairfield Road at Marsh Creek and you're headed toward Gettysburg, right at the Black Horse Tavern Road, there's a right-hand turn. I think it's Black Horse Tavern Road, if I'm uh -huh. not mistaken. And Mike, almost, Jim, Jim, just pull that into you a little bit more there. Yeah. Almost immediately, you go up over a ridge, and there's a housing development there. And that's the ridge where Longstreet crested the ridge. Okay. And you can see the round tops yeah. there. What Porter Alexander did is he went to the right there, where the houses okay. are, but kind of behind him, there's a... So, so he used the ridge that that hill is yeah. on, or the end of, basically, as his cover. So he went a little further out to uh, to conceal his movements. Yeah, because there's a ridge. That, there's a housing development on the ridge where Longstreet turned around. Right. And and uh, Alexander just went to the bottom of the ridge, used it as concealment, kind of followed that low ground to the creek, and then went south along the creek, and then was able to come east again back onto the road they were originally on. Okay. But now, when he comes out back on the road, the Black Horse Road, they're well below the trees of Seminary Ridge, cannot be seen from the round tops. Got it. Okay. All right, so let's move on here to Quinn2477. He asks, for Ask a Guide, of the many medals of honor awarded at Gettysburg, which one or two stand out most to you? Also, as a follow-up, was, uh, was there any equivalent the Confederate Congress or Army would have awarded to its soldiers? Yeah, I'm, I'm real glad you gave me these questions last night, Matt, so I had a chance to think about them. <laughs> um, at first, I, didn't, I couldn't think of any medals of honor that really stuck, uh, struck me, but ex except for Chamberlain. You know, the obvious, what he does. But um, actually there was, but I, I don't have specifics on it. I just know that at least one guy, I think there were like 73 Medals of Honor awarded, I think, to Union soldiers at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And some of them over time, not right away. Right. Um, the most recent, wasn't that given by Obama? Yeah. Cushing? Uh, Alonzo Cushing, that's yeah. exactly right. That yeah. was November 2014. Yeah. That's how recent that was. Yeah. That's not even six years ago. No. That's exactly, the, yeah. they, and that was the guy who had to wait longer than any American. Yeah. to receive a Medal of Honor. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good point. Uh, I like that one. But there was a story that um, uh, somebody came off the field 
uh, union guys. I don't know who it was. I don't know what union it was. I can't think of it. But he came off the field with a, uh, a Confederate flag that had been discarded uh, and got the Medal of Honor for it. So just just for coming just off for the field a with a flag. Yeah. Right. Um, so th- t- I've told that story before in tours. And so now wait, is he the one that didn't actually, he just picked it up? Yeah. Like, like he you didn't actually. You could get the Medal of Honor for yeah. coming off the field with a flag. That's why that's one of my favorite Medal of Honor Sure. Stories. Yeah. Not to take away from him, I'm sure he was brave in other ways, but for that particular deed of getting the flag, it's not like he wrested it from the hands of uh, some, you know, Confederate who was determined to hold on to it. It was just on the ground. But knowing how protective they were of the flag. Yeah. That guy had to be in some danger to come yeah, off sure, the field. Sure, I'm imagining. Yeah, he's he's in the front lines. He's, yeah. he's close to danger. So. Or, or enough of the guys who that flag belonged to were wiped out or scared enough that they just skedaddled and left it, you know? so Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Any other ones? The, uh, Not that comes straight no, to my mind. No. As soon as we get down here and walk out the door, you, you'll like, remember oh, those. Absolutely. <laughs> of course. So, that's what I saw. <laughs> uh, untold underscore Civil War underscore podcast wants to know. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you get a chance, listen to that podcast because it's uh, he does a very good job with it and the stories are very interesting and it's an entertaining show. Um, uh, it says, I know the 79th New York Highlanders and I know of John MacArthur's Highland Brigade out west. Were there any Highlanders slash Scottish inspired units at Gettysburg? There may have been, but I don't know of any that come to my mind. But when I saw that question, it, it really hit home for me because um, the colonel of that unit was Colonel James Cameron, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, the, the director. <laughs> <laughs> he had two brothers, um, William Cameron and I believe Simon Cameron, who was the, the Commonwealth mm. Pennsylvania Secretary okay. of the Commonwealth during the Civil War. And Simon Cameron and William Cameron had their hometown, same place I'm from. Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, cool. Uh, James Cameron was from Milton, Pennsylvania, which is Northumberland County, about four miles away from Lewisburg. And his house is still um, along the Susquehanna River. Um, and the Milton Historical Society <laughs> owns it. Oh, cool. And um, uh, there's a statue of the Colonel of the 79th Highlanders um, in the middle of Sunbury, Pennsylvania, along the Susquehanna River, about 10 miles south of Lewisburg. It's called Cameron Park, and there's a statue hmm. of James Cameron there. Um, and the interesting thing about Cameron is he was in charge of 79th New, uh, New York Islanders at First Manassas. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was mortally wounded. And they have a marker up by the um, uh, Henry House, which is a famous landmark uh, up on um, uh, Henry Hill. Henry, Henry House Hill, Hill, yeah. Near the Visitor Center yeah. at First Manassas, where he was killed. And um, where I used to live in Lewisburg, almost right across the street, um, in the next block, a lady I know named Betty Cook owns the William Cameron House. The, the fire department up there is named after his brother, William Cameron. They brought his body to his brother's house, and, and Betty showed me the fireplace where they laid his body at when they had the funeral at his house. Oh, cool. And he's, he's buried in Lewisburg today. So I can't answer the question about Highlanders and Scottish being here in Gettysburg. Maybe there were, maybe some of my colleagues know. I don't. But I do have that connection to James yeah. Highland, or James or Cameron that he mentioned. And like I said, there's a statue of him in oh, Sunbury, Pennsylvania, cool, right downtown, right on the main street. So, I mean, there were um, other units that were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Ethnic? Ethnic, yeah. But, I mean, like, uh, you know, of course, the, famously, you have the Irish Brigade. And that's a whole brigade of mm-hmm. Irish guys. Were there any, uh, was, the 24, was it the 24th Georgia Cobbs Legion? Were they here on the Confederate side? Cops Legion was here, I believe. Yeah, and they're Irish, aren't they? Weren't they the guys uh, up against them at the wall on Marie's Heights? That may that may well be. I believe so. Anyway, but that's just off the top of my head, and I'm not a guide, so you don't care what I have to say, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so let's move on <laughs> to the next question. JDSW20 says, could you please explain Double Day's removal from command of the First Corps on the evening of July 1st? I've often read that this was Double Day's finest hour, only to be pulled from command that same night. Thanks. Exactly. It's a very good question. Um Double A was the senior division commander of the First Corps under Reynolds. And Reynolds, as you know, gets killed almost immediately mm-hmm. as he's putting the first uh, infantry into the fight at the uh, uh, Herp, what we call the Herps Woods and McPherson Woods. And Double Day, uh, due to his seniority, rises to command of the First Corps, which at, you know, in the morning were the only Union troops that were here fighting west of town. And about noon, Howard arrives with the 11th Corps and fights north of town. Um, about 4 o'clock, 4.30, 
Uh, the Union right north of town at Barlow's Knoll is overlapped by Confederates coming down the Harrisburg mm-hmm. Road, Jubilers Division. Um, at almost exactly the same time, but independently, um, Doubles Day's left, First Corps is overlapped by Confederates coming down the Fairfield Road, uh, where we are right now. Um, and the word that came back to Howard was that uh, Double A's men had given way. Well, yeah, they had. It's the one day on the battle that they're outnumbered, ultimately about 28,000, about 20,000 men. And uh, the word comes back to Howard, who is assumed commander of the seniority um, when he arrives before Hancock got here. Um, Double A's men gave way. And so, you know, this is the word that goes out, you know, Double A's, Double A, give way. It was just like Howard, uh, you know, he, he never. Who, who gave way first, though? Because I know that's kind of a thing, isn't I, it? I really think it's pretty simultaneous, Matt. Yeah. I really do. I've always thought it was. That's always the impression I got, too. One thing's for sure. Once the 11th Corps gave way, and I can't blame them at all. I mean, when you look at the fields north of town. Hell no. Flat, devoid of trees, different yeah. from what's out here west of town. Um, but once they started to fall back, then the Confederates started to get in behind the 1st Corps lines along right. um, uh, Seminary Ridge. Uh, on day one. So the, the position of the first Corps west of town was untenable anyhow. Right. Uh, but their line was being overlapped. And uh, that wasn't meant to be where three days of, well, they didn't know it was going to be three days, but like their intention was not to hold out right. west of town and north of town forever. Right. It was to delay. Yeah, it was to, the, the whole fallback position is Cemetery Hill. Right. And you're just, like you said, you're fighting a, a delaying action um, uh, so that Union reinforcements can come up and occupy Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge in strength. Mm-hmm. So you're just holding them off um, until that can occur. And uh, they, they, they did, Union Army did a great job on sure. that one. But, uh, but now with with the double day thing, though, so Reynolds is put in command of the left wing, okay, right? Right. All right. That's right, left wing. Before the, before the battle. Here, right, yeah. which means he's also in charge of Sickles Third Corps and Howard's 11th Corps. Right. But he gets killed, so Howard takes over. So, okay. Now, because I know this confuses a lot of people. So when he takes command of the left wing, he's got three corps to worry about now. So That's now right. Doubleday is in first command. Corps. Yeah, so really before he gets killed, Doubleday is the commander of the first corps? That's right, man. Okay. That is technically correct. So then the battle occurs... Um, and Reynolds is killed before Howard gets to the field, correct? Or around about the same time? Uh, before he gets before here. Before he gets here. Um, he got killed probably around, um, he got here around 1030, like maybe 1015 to 1045, and Howard arrives around noon. Okay. So then Double Day, who's already in command of the Corps, and the First Corps is the only Corps engaged, right. sees himself as in command of the field. Yes. And then Howard arrives, new to the field. Right. Though he should be the guy who takes over command of the battle now, mm-hmm. um, Doubleday, what do, doesn't agree? Like, isn't there some? Isn't this kind of a point where there's a little bit of a? I think Doubleday knew that Howard, by seniority, would, would okay. take command upon his arrival. Um, but Howard has the north of town, and Doubleday has the west of town. Okay. And I think when Hancock arrived, Hancock had been authorized by Meet Meet down in Tawnytown. Earlier that day, they had discussed the plan, um, and Meade sends Hancock up here and says, "Now you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to have seniority to take command, but I am giving you authority to take command because you know what I have in mind here. You know what I want, and you're going to see the lay of the land. And I think you should have that responsibility." Uh, who says this to who? Meade says this to Hancock. To Hancock, correct? Right. Who, okay. Who leaves Meade? Who stays down in Tony Town to bring the rest of the Union Army up? He comes forward ahead of his. Second Corps, Corps. Right. And Hancock arrives on Cemetery Hill at the lowest moment for the Union Army in the Battle of Gettysburg. It's late afternoon the first day, and all the bad deeds are in effect. Uh-huh. Defeat, demoralization, disorganization. And the Union troops are, are the ones who uh, evade capture in the town, and 4,000 of them don't they get captured, are, are coming out of south into town, and they're coming up onto Cemetery Hill. And, you know, they, they, they could have just kept on going over Cemetery Hill right back toward... Uh, Maryland, where their pre-prepared position uh, has been established by me along Pipe Creek, mm-hmm. and Hancock arrives, and uh, and in that low moment, that that moment of chaos, he says, "No, you know, it's a great place to fight. You guys over here on this side of the road behind the wall, and you guys over here, he's telling them to stop and rally, and it's the turning point in the battle. Uh, at that point, the Union Army has retreated to higher ground than anything on the first day's field, which right. is Oak Hill, and the mm-hmm. Confederates control that. Right. That night, the Union Army gets more heavily reinforced than the Confederates." They form a three-mile line, which will be half the length of the surrounding Confederate line. 
And now the Union line uh, is the interior lines, the greatest distance between two points in the Union line, Culp's so the round top, two miles. two miles. The outer Confederate line that surrounds the Union line goes through towns about twice that length, right. about six miles long. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, the word gets back, I think, uh, to uh, probably uh, Hancock and, and probably eventually to Meade. Uh, Doubleday gave way. Well, you know, <laughs> Howard isn't going to come and say, my men gave way north of town. <laughs> of course, <laughs> right. Doubleday's men gave way. So the, the impression is that Doubleday's men didn't fight particularly well. This is going back to people who weren't even here when it was when it was occurring. So yeah, I think Doubleday gets a, a, a raw deal. And uh, when the Sixth Corps arrives, General Newton, Division Commander, Sixth Corps, last Union troops to arrive, uh, second day, he is then uh, ordered to take command of the First Corps. And that's, that's a slight to Doubleday. Sure. But uh, it, it isn't right. But it's, it's just one of those things where... A report comes back that's not accurate uh, and, and gives uh, it's kind of misinformation, and, 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 and it's that double day somehow failed. And I, I don't think I don't think he did it all. I don't think most people here would. Uh, I think most people here at Gettysburg would agree. The double day's men, just like the Eleventh Corps north of town, did everything they could as right. long as they could. They couldn't take it. Yeah, didn't matter who was in command out there. No, the line was going to get overlapped in sure. the retreat. Yeah, no, I mean, it was inevitable that it was going to happen. It's, it's obvious. I mean, of course, this is all with hindsight, but it's obvious that they were overwhelmed. Uh, all right, so let's see. Moving on to the next one here. The hiking historian is back. She's got three questions. We're going to try to get through these pretty quick, okay? Um, actually, yeah, okay, so here we go. The hiking historian wants to know, my ancestor was in the 93rd PA, but was released due to tuberculosis. He managed to survive and then re enlist as a substitute in the 149th Bucktails. Was substituting a common practice? How did it work? Any reasons why soldiers would have switched units? Yeah, a lot of interesting questions there. Yeah. Um, substitution was uh, something that wasn't unusual at all. And it was a deal where you could actually pay somebody. Uh, you know, you get drafted. But you could actually pay somebody to uh, fill your, your spot. And I think the amount usually was like $300, which, you know, who knows what that's worth today, but yeah. a lot more than that. Um, so her ancestor apparently got injured wounded he 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 had uh, tb he was uh, discharged for uh, due to tb okay. and then he survived and reenlisted as a substitute so i guess somebody got drafted yeah. and then he went as their substitute into the 149 and got paid but yeah. evidently he went originally into the 93rd um uh, 93rd PA. legitimate enlistment which was 6th um, corps right no, uh, yeah, I believe so. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, I believe so. Yay. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure you're right about that. Um, and he does the honorable thing. I mean, he, he did his part. He comes back and he enlists in a, in a, in a unit that has a, a very high reputation. That's the Bucktails. That's uh, the Stones Brigade that yeah. fought out of here on, on day one. Um, so it, it was not an unusual uh, situation at all to uh, hire substitutes. Um, maybe he needed the money. I don't know. Um, the, the number of the unit is the order in which they were formed mm -hmm. in that branch of service for the Civil War. Right. So the 93rd was formed before the 149th. It's possible, I don't know, because I think the 93rd was here, that their term of enlistment, because some of them, you know, only enlisted for like three months or nine months at a time. Right. The term of enlistment, by the time he came back from TB, could have expired. Well, sure. And he wants to, to do his part. So... Maybe he finds that the 149th is still out there and is, is trying to replace losses. I, I don't know when he came back, but um, he had losses from you know right here at Gettysburg or maybe Chancellorsville, um, uh, and reenlist to his to his credit. Right, I, I don't so, hear that happening. So, often. so basically, like what you're saying is the, the 93rd could no longer be in existence, possibly. Possibly, right. their, their term of enlistment may have ended by the time he comes back into right. the fold, and yeah, which which explain why he would enlist in a different unit, right? But they're both from Pennsylvania, right? So maybe the 149th is now starting to to form up, or maybe they're looking for people to replace the losses they took in places like Gettysburg here, where they took a lot of losses, sure, and they needed probably needed experienced men. I don't know, he, he might have even come back at a higher rank given his experience. Okay. I don't All know. Right. I'm just speculating. All right. All right. Well, then, uh, let's see. She's got another question here. What was the uh, basic training like for Civil War soldiers? Nothing like I think it is today in the military, you know, where you're no. doing all the the running and the Marines doing uh, what they call the crucible at the end of training, you know, 48 hours of constant activity. Yeah. Um, you know, a big thing right before Gettysburg was hygiene when um, Hooker took over. And they really made an effort to start to dig um, 
latrines. trenches, latrines, mm-hmm. trenches. They built uh, uh, wooden platforms to put tents on, um, improve the the food and everything because they were really losing a lot of guys to disease. Um, I think the main things that they were looking at are uh, how to use your rifle, nine step procedure to fire your rifle, making sure the uh, soldier individually knows how to operate his weapon. And then the other thing is integrating him into the unit. So, um, you know, learning how to move with a unit, like a, a, how to wheel right, wheel left, refuse left, um, you know, move from Just column formation. drill, basically. Drill. Yeah. A lot. And if you read the accounts of soldiers, uh, you know, they write letters home. Uh, a lot of times they say uh, today's activity was wake up. You know, clean up, drill, drill, take lunch, drill, drill, have dinner, you know, <laughs> right. drill some more, and then right. revel in. Uh-huh. So I think most of it was it was uh, a lot of uh, drill, just teaching guys how to. Because now, and Eric, why don't you open your mic here? Because you you were actually in the service and you're a reenactor. Yeah, you and, get a good person to answer that. Yeah, so so I mean, uh, I'm guessing I haven't been in the service nor do I reenact, but I'm guessing back in those days it was. Uh, more teaching you how to be part of a cohesive unit today. It's like everybody's an army of one, as they say. Is that right? Like you know, each man is a warrior instead of a soldier. So, kind of the kind of the whole thought process behind it is completely different today than it was then. Uh, at the time of the war, you're talking about you've got two two main places where you're going to get new people. It's either going to be a new regiment that's got to be trained entirely from the ground up. Okay. Or you have, like you guys were just talking about, substitutes coming in, but they're not getting like any kind of basic training. They get brought to the front by some kind of escort unit from the regiment that they're going to. Then they get thrown into a company and off you go. Okay. And they pick up training as the unit's doing it, not like... They're, they're training on the go. Like, yeah, there's uh, not yeah. like a training camp set up at Camp Curtin or right. or any of those where you've got like a depot that's taking individuals and training them to a basic standard and then they get put out. It's <laughs> you're a substitute or you got drafted. You're going to report to this camp at whatever date. And then the unit that you're going to has sent an escort to take you to them wherever they are. Okay. And so like I just got done reading the regimental history of the 111th PA and you go through the roster in the back of the book and you can see they get this massive amount of substitutes. It's either late 63 or early 64 right before the uh, Atlanta campaign. And all of these guys have deserted. Within about a space of two months. Huh. So they go from getting somewhere around 250 to 300 replacements as substitutes. And like 75% of these guys are gone before they even start out on the Atlantic campaign. Wow. So it, it's kind of two completely different schools of right. thought. So but today, though, when you go in and you get you go through basic and everything like that, what what are they... What are you doing? You're doing, I mean, you're learning a lot of things because there's a lot more technology available to you, right? Um, the, the, the weaponry is more complicated. Yeah, so most of it is, um, you know, how basically how to be a soldier, you know, right? It, they, they teach you some close order drill stuff that you need to know when you get out into the line units. Um, but a lot of it is based around this is how your weapon functions, this is how you shoot it. These are some basic by the book maneuvers that'll kind of maybe keep you alive. But <laughs> the whole premise is, and they even tell you that, or they did when I went through basic anyways, they tell you like, once you get out to your line unit, they're going to teach you a completely different way of doing this to their standard. This is just what the army's standard is. Right. And this is what we have to have you to before it, we can put you out. It's like uh, when you watch movies about uh, Vietnam and they get the replacements in and then the, the vets who are already, who've been on the line for six months or whatever, they say, all right, you're not going to need this. You know, and they just start throwing stuff away. Yeah. You, yeah. You basically take everything you learn at basic training and dump it within the first two weeks <laughs> right. after you get to your unit. Right. All right. So we got uh, one more question from the hiking historian and then another one from the great Trinetti, but we're going to take a break from first and then we're going to come back and uh, get to those questions and wrap up for you so we'll be right back get out of the car 
April 18th, 10 a.m. at the North Carolina Memorial on Confederate Avenue. Be there for the first walking tour of the 2020 season. Our theme this year is Get Out of the Car. And we will take you to parts of the battlefield you cannot see from the road. Licensed battlefield guide Lewis Trott, who you know from the show, will lead us across the field of the Pickett Pettigrew Trimble Assault. Over the ruins of the Bliss Farm. To the 111th New York Monument on the Bryan Farm. There we'll pose for a wet plate photograph. Made by Dave Wilson from the Victorian Photography Studio. And watch it develop before our eyes. Then stick around and clean up the area around the 111th New York Monument, which we adopted. And finally, round off the day at 4 p.m. at Mason Dixon Distillery for a private concert featuring Sarah Larson and Danny Stewart as they play the music of Addressing Gettysburg, which is featured in our narrative episodes. This tour is free and sponsored by Mason Dixon Distillery. The concert's free, but you're buying your own food and drinks. So come out and help us kick off the season. Meet fellow Gettys nerds, make some friends, and experience your history. We need a head count, so email Matt at Address. Gettysburg.com. That's April 18th, 10 a.m., North Carolina Memorial. And we hope we get to meet you. Think outside the bus and let Gettys Bike Tours show you the only way to truly experience Gettysburg. There's a reason why Gettys Bike Tours is the longest-running bicycle tour company in Gettysburg, and that's because they put the customer's experience at the top of their list of priorities. Follow a licensed battlefield guide through some of the most legendary ground in American history. There's a tour route for everyone, from the newbie to the hardcore history buff. So go to Gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 and book your reservation today. Mention addressing Gettysburg and receive 10% off your tour. That's Gettysbike.com or 717-752-7752. Discount does not apply to rentals. Uh, my favorite place to go. Mason Dixon Distillery. They create their award-winning spirits from grain grown on Gettysburg National Military Park. And they cook their comfort food from ingredients sourced from local farms. For great food, amazing drinks, engaging conversation, and plenty of on-site parking, which is really hard to find here in Gettysburg, head over to Mason Dixon Distillery located at 331 East Water Street. Mention you heard this ad on addressing Gettysburg and get a free dessert with any meal. That's right. I said free just because you mentioned this show. That's Mason Dixon Distillery, 331 East Water Street, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Victorian Photography Studio, located on Steinware Avenue in historic downtown Gettysburg, is a vintage tintype and digital portrait studio. With hundreds of dresses and uniforms, as well as period-correct props and backgrounds, VPS can help you capture the perfect moment in time. As one of the few remaining practitioners of the craft, the photographers at VPS are trained in the history and artistry of wet plate collodion photography. So stop on in or book online for a truly unique Gettysburg experience. Go to VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram at VPS underscore Gettysburg. That's VictorianPhotographyStudio.com and at VPS underscore Gettysburg on social media. Dog tags in the Civil War, one of the most devastating Union defeats took place in Florida, Confederate Lancers in New Mexico, a camel as a regimental mascot. Learn this and more on the Untold Civil War podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, and Buzzsprout website. Okay, I know spots like these are annoying, but they're a necessary evil when it comes to free content, so here we go. There are three ways to support this show and the Addressing Gettysburg project as a whole. One, the most effective way, is becoming a monthly subscriber at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash addressing Gettysburg. Our patrons receive access to interviews with experts recorded especially for them. Number two, the fun way by getting some merch over at our store at addressing Gettysburg dot com. Show that you are in the know by wearing one of our t-shirts, hoodies, or other items at addressing Gettysburg dot com. And number three, the free way. You shop at Amazon like everyone else, so why not make those unnecessary sales that only make you feel guilty anyway count for something? Every time you want to go and shop on Amazon, go to AddressingGettysburg.com first, then click that Amazon banner at the top of the homepage, then sign in and shop like you normally would. The beauty of this is that Amazon gives us credit for qualifying sales while it doesn't cost you one cent more than you intended to spend in the first place. But you gotta make sure that you do it every time you shop Amazon. Okay there, we're finished with the obligatory pitch for your support. <laughs> Man, our Patreon patrons must be laughing right now saying, we don't have to sit through commercials on Patreon. Wink. 
Okay, we're back, and let's get to the third question with the hiking historian. She wants to know, what is your favorite historic building or home in Gettysburg? Are there any uh, that are often um, overlooked by visitors? I saw that question, and I thought, that is just a, a wonderful question. I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Um, because very few people have ever asked me that, and it made me start to think. Mm-hmm. And I thought, nothing comes to my mind. Something did. Um one farm before I get to the one that I think probably is the one that I, is my favorite is the uh, P. Snyder farm down by the Arkansas Memorial down along Emmitsburg Road. And the reason I guess I like that farm is because, you know, almost all the historic buildings on the battlefield are occupied by park rangers. Right. Who the idea is that uh, buildings that are occupied are better maintained than buildings that are vacant. And that building is one of the few that's vacant. That's the little old wooden one, right? That's right. Yeah. And the reason it's, I like to think it's vacant is because. What makes it kind of unique when you drive by it there's an outhouse right now. oh yes <laughs> so like, well there's a plumbing problem yeah anybody who lives there in january in the middle of the night has to leave the house and go uh, there. so i thought of that but um there is a house i talk about all the time <clears throat> on tours and I, I probably should mention it and it's the schultz house um oh yeah it's owned by herman hopped h-a-u-p-t who's in charge of the military railroads during the civil war was here at gettysburg during a battle um and uh, it was Abner Doubleday's headquarters. And it's located at the corner of West Middle Street and Confederate Avenue by the seminary. In other words, where Middle Street goes over the seminary ridge, um, it's on the southeastern corner. And many people have seen it. Yeah. It's got a very unique architecture. Beautiful it's house. Beautiful house. And beautiful uh, price tag when it's on the market. Oh, yeah. It was on the market last year. And I think they were looking for a little bit less than a million. I think it was like. 850 is, is what I remember. But now I seem to remember about 10 years ago, someone, I don't know who, I don't know if it's the same owners or not, but they were trying to sell it and they were, uh, they had it on the market for like 3 million or am I imagining I that? heard like 1.6 million. Okay, 1.6. And then it didn't sell it. Yeah. And they had to lower it to just under a million. Right. And uh, what Eric said, I heard like uh, 889, something like that. Yeah, it was somewhere between eight and 900,000. That's yeah. a little more, more reasonable to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I, not that I could afford it, but I, it's, you know, I mean, it's a beautiful house. But let me ask you this, though, about because I've always wondered this. It's the Schultz house. It was Doubleday's headquarters. How much of the existing house today is Civil War era? Do yeah, you know? I don't know for sure, but I think most of it is. I think I've seen pictures of it. Really? Uh, at the time. Because it looks like it's a, a hodgepodge of architecture. Yeah. Like, it doesn't look... It's unique. Yeah, it is. But here, and it's beautiful inside. Have you seen pictures of it inside? Yes, I have. Oh, uh, only man. Once. Uh, apparently, when it was on the market, you could get photos of the inside, which was pretty yeah, amazing. That's yeah, that's what I saw. I pulled them off Realtor.com, and it was <laughs> amazing. Yeah. But what I would one of the reasons I like it so much... It, is what's inside. Okay. Now, I haven't been in there to see it. Okay. But there's a, a, a guy who used to drive the uh, Gettysburg Tour Center bus uh, for the Gettysburg Tour Center, and he retired a couple of years ago. His name is Jack. And when that house went on sale, what was it, about 10, 12 years ago, Eric? Yeah. Um, uh, Jack took the opportunity to go in because the house was open since oh, it was open on the house. Yeah, sure. In. Yeah. So he went in. He saw bloody footprint stains. Oh, in neat. In a corner of the room. And there are footprint stains of surgeons because the house was a hospital oh, and, right. the, and the surgeons were performing so many amputations on wounded soldiers in the house that the surgeons themselves were soaked with blood. Uh, so the smocks they wear, trouser legs, right down to their leather shoes. And I haven't been in there, but uh, I have been in another place. Uh, uh, there's, I'll give some free advertising to the Baladari Inn Bed and Breakfast oh, yeah. on Hospital Road. I've been there too. It's You've a nice there, place. Matt? Yep. Well, they have bloody footprint stains near a window. Both I did not were, see those. Near windows. Um, a friend of mine was staying there years ago, and he took me over to the corner of the room, and he pointed out to this dark stain. He said, what does it look like? And I said, well, it looks like the outline of a shoe. And he said, that's what it is. So then Jack had told me, the driver, about the footprints he'd seen in the Schultz house that I have not seen. And we were talking, and both of them the one I saw and the one he saw in two different buildings were near windows, and it made all the sense in the world. Going to vomit. Well, no, they um, they didn't have any natural light. Uh, so when they would perform yes, meditations, they put these tables next to windows. They used natural light. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's why these... Oh, but, yes. And if you ever watch that uh, that Civil War series, uh, Mercy Street, yeah, um, there's a scene where Josh Radner, who plays a union doctor, is standing with his back to the window, and he, he's got a patient on a table, and on the opposite side of the doctor... 
There's a guy holding a mirror from a chest of drawers at an angle. He's reflecting the sunlight. Uh, yeah. Did you see that episode? No, no, no. But I, uh, I, I get where you're going with that. You can picture that. Yeah. He's reflecting the sunlight through the window down onto the patient opposite the doctor. And I went, wow. That's pretty so, good. Yeah. So I, whenever I make that turn off of Middle Street onto West Confederate Avenue along the Confederate battle line, the six mile long on day two and three, I talk about that. Uh, this morning I did that with a group from Texas and talk about the bloody footprints. Oh, that's amazing. On the floor, so. Um, how about in town? You have any in town besides the Schultz house? Uh, how about the Wills house? Oh, the Wills house. Yeah, yeah. simply because Lincoln stayed there. Sure. Um, and it's a cool house. Yeah. I mean, it's big. I've been in there. Yeah. Other than a lot of buildings that I haven't. Um, oh, well, you know, the Shriver house. Okay, I give them a plug. Shriver, sure. Um, absolutely. You, know, you can go up to the attic. Uh, it's open to the public. And they actually have blood stains up there in a window where Confederate sharpshooters hit. A few years ago, detectives from Buffalo, homicide mm -hmm. detectives, went up there, asked for permission to take samples to see if they could get DNA off the blood stains because they figured anything they ever encountered, um, you know, would, would certainly be able to analyze if you can analyze something from 1863. Sure. sure. Uh, Farnsworth House, of course, um, um, got the little window up there, you know, where the Confederates were and all the bullet holes all over. Now, so, have you been up there? Can you go up uh, there in the Farnsworth House? I worked there. For, oh, okay. for summer, and and someone close to me worked there for for many years, and so I was able to to do a like a ghost tour or whatever. They yeah. they took us up there. I was, I've been up there once or twice. And I think right. I've been up there once or twice in the Shriver House. So you, you know, actually see evidence from from the ballots. Pretty cool. Sure. Yeah. Uh, of course. That's that's neat. I always like the uh, the, the what the hell was it called? The House of Bender on, uh, the, on square. the square. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't been in there. I have a friend who was doing like renovations in there and he said that like there's still bullets in the rafters. Wow. And, and, uh, yeah, he said, he showed me some pictures of the, of the place. It's pretty cool because there's, you know, just, just, there's just the layers of history in these buildings and you could tell, Oh, these renovations were made in the 1950s because of this and that and the other thing. And, but you could still see the original, uh, building and, you know, intent of the building, uh, when, when, you know, when it's empty and you're renovating it and stripping it down and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt, there's something else I thought of when, and this was when I saw the question last night that you supplied to me. Um, and you just reminded me of it again. Uh, one of my favorite houses is one that doesn't exist anymore. And that's the for the Forney Farm, which would oh. be right behind the 17th Pennsylvania Cavalry Marker up by the Peace Light Memorial. Yeah. But the reason I'm bringing that up is um, when you're in the museum, the Visitor Center, and you know the Visitor Center is arranged like a gallery, and you go, you wind your way through these mazes, and they mm -hmm. hit you with uh, mm -hmm. things that happened before Gettysburg, battles before Gettysburg. And then the, the heart of the museum is the three galleries for each day of the battle. Well, as you're going through the portal from day one to day two, there's a series of wooden beams from the Forney House. Yeah. And they have the path that a cannonball went through the beams. And you can look up and see it. And that was from the Forney Farm. Unfortunately, they took it down in the 50s. But uh, I always think of the Forney Farm when I think of that. And that, that's pretty cool. So anybody yeah. you know, who hasn't been up here or has been up here but hasn't been in the museum and seen that... Um, it's a pretty cool thing to look for. Sure. Yeah. No, I always remember that. I think when I first came here, that impressed me the most. Like, that's always been stuck in my head, the image of that. That was at the old visitor center, you know. Um, it, the Forney Farm, was it the 50s or was it before the 75th that they did that? I thought it was taken out in the 50s. I thought oh, that's okay. what I'd heard recently. Okay. Which would mean it should have been there during the. During the 75th. And I know what you, you, you're saying that because there was just a huge crowd of people all yeah. around that watching FDR dedicate the peace light. Right. Um, I've and seen I, pictures I, of 40 Farm, but I've never seen them you know, during that 1938. Right, right. Because uh, I, I, the reason I, I feel like it was for the 75th was because they, uh, the superintendent of the park. He just wanted to make room for crowds, so so he said. Yeah, he basically said, "Oh yeah, it's structurally unfit, and we're not even sure if it's a historic building." Oh well, now that, <laughs> but up to that point, because obviously it was. Yeah, uh, I, the story is consistent with what you said. Yeah, that that yeah, they were worried about that, um, and that the uh, the thing was supposedly falling apart anyhow. Today they would get in there and do everything and they fix could it, to, to yeah. fix it, and the thinking was just different. Back then, I, I can't imagine that because yeah, I remember uh, Tim was telling me one time that the um, uh, uh, middle school now, you know, over there by Culps Hill and Cemetery Hill uh, was uh, basically that property was given to the borough by the Park Service. Like it was some kind of weird swap or something. I read and, about that. I mean, that boggles my mind. 
Yeah, they're. Um, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> you know, uh, there was a, there's a book on the history of the battlefield, and it was just written. Um, can't think of the author's name right now. Oh, Somebody I got it. Read it. Well, but um, uh, uh, she's now a um, college professor down at uh, Virginia Wise um, in southwestern Virginia. She used to be a, a, a seasonal park ranger here. I can't think of her name right now. But not, um, not, uh, uh, she wrote a book on the history of the battlefield. And I remember reading that section, and it said what was going on is the, the I think the park was concerned that the town was going to put a housing development near where Stevens Knoll is today, like Menchie Spring, uh-huh. and that they made that deal, gave up that land near where the middle school is, um, that swap, in order to keep the borough from developing that land. That's what I read. So, okay, so the... All right, so uh, when that happened then, so the, the borough owned, what, out to Menchie Springs? Yeah, apparently they did. They owned some land in that area. Okay. And we're thinking about developing it, like for houses and stuff. Oh, my God. The park didn't want that, so they were willing to give up that land where the where the, where the football stadium right. is at the middle school today. Right. And that's how that, that got into Wow. Wow. House. And that's where the Louisiana Tigers charged up, right? Yeah. Yeah, very, that's crazy. Yeah, supposedly, you know the story about. Um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just drawing all kinds of blanks today. Um, North Carolina uh, Colonel Francis um, wrote the note, "Tell my father I died with my face to the enemy." B- B- Bergwin? Uh, uh, no. Uh, no. Um, what the? I'm just drawing a blank. But know, supposedly he scribbled that near where the concession stand of the football field is today. Avery. Avery. Yeah. Isaac Avery. Yeah. Is it, is it Isaac Avery? Yeah, it's Isaac Avery. Yeah, okay. So thank well, you. if thank it you, isn't, it is now. Avery, that's who it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, Avery. Uh, he wrote it at the concession stand, is that what you just said? Yeah, that's what I read. <laughs> that that's where he was wounded. Where the yeah. concession stand today stands is supposedly where he scribbled that note. It's just really amazing to look at how previous uh, generations... Uh, to just to see what they valued and how they looked at a piece of ground and treated it. And, you know, like today, the thought of all of these things is so is like reprehensible to us. Yeah. You know, built on the battlefield. And and it, and it almost like even when things are restored, for me, it kind of it's nice, but it also loses a little bit of it because it isn't untouched. It isn't pure. You know, it's not untouched since 1863. It's restored to what we think it was in 1863. And so anything that any treasures that are left in that ground are gone from whenever they, you know, had to build the, the hotel that was there or whatever it may be. Um, but at least it's not, you know, at least it's back to National Park or not back to National Park. Go ahead. Well, I remember the name of that author. Okay. There used to be a seasonal ranger here. It was Jen Murray. Okay. And she's the one that wrote the history of the battlefield that I uh, got that from. And you were just talking about something that touched on something else that she wrote that really hit home with me when I read the history. And it's that, uh, you know, when the War Department ran the battlefield, from right. when it first became a, a national military park in 1895, um, the War Department ran the battlefield and they maintained it the way it looked at the time of the battle because they were using the battlefield to train officers and they figured like the Park Service today, to their credit, the more it looks the way it did at the time, the battle easier it is to understand what's going sure, on. Yeah. But when the Park Service took over in 1933, uh, they were coming from a background of natural beauty. Uh, and Jen actually yeah. writes that they were actually planting trees, the Park Service, to conceal <laughs> monuments right. to enhance natural beauty because that's where the Park Service right, is coming from right. as opposed to interpretation of the battle. Now, thankfully... In recent years, that's all changed. Yes. And and now the park is more moving toward seeing things the way it was then. But there was a time when they first came in. This is the way they were they were thinking, and they were kind of de-emphasizing. Well, that's, I think, probably when the, the uh, red bud was planted by a park superintendent, which is great today. Where, where, where are you talking? The red bud. The, the purplish um, flower that comes out in April, late April. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The gorgeous flower. <laughs> yeah. That was planted, I think, in the 1950s by oh, a so park superintendent. Oh, so those aren't native to the battlefield? That was planted, I think, intentionally by a park superintendent throughout the park. And today, it makes the park, I think, the most beautiful time of year. Sure. When you oh, see that. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like, there's so many layers of history on just this 6,000 acres here that, you know, it's not just the battle. It's, there's so much more to that. Eric, you look like you were about to say something. Well, no, no, I've called attention to you now. Don't wave me off. I, I thought part of that tree planting initiative was uh, soil conservation during the 30s. 
Uh, that was my understanding of it. Oh, uh, yeah, it might have been, yeah. Good one, Eric. <laughs> I do what I can. You call out the expert. Thanks. No, I'm just teasing you. It's okay. No, Eric, don't cry. Eric, oh, oh, Eric. <laughs> well, you know, today the park maintains the battlefield by leasing it to local farmers. Yes. The thinking being that yes. the best way to preserve the battlefield is to use the way it was used then. It was farmland. Yeah. So they leased, I don't know how many people know this, but they leased the battlefield to farmers who raise a crop on it, sell it. Yeah. Part of the profit they make in the sale of crops goes back to the park. But the best thing of all, the ground is preserved the way it was then. So. Yeah. And and it, and it adds to the aesthetic as you're driving around there and you're seeing corn. Even though it might not have been corn at the time of the battle, you got to rotate your crops They, they rotate such. good agricultural practice to rotate yeah. the crops. So you're right. Now, our peach orchards are always going to be peach trees. Right. And our wheat fields are always going to be um, wheat, wheat fields. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I have noticed... Weeds. That you're, you can be out here driving on the first day's field, and one year what was corn the next year looks like weed or something right, like that. Right, <laughs> right. But that's okay. Um, one of our favorite people in the world, the great Trinetti, he wants to get deep into the psyche of our guy today. And he asks, what is your opinion of George McClellan? I know he is very controversial, and I see why. I, I think George McClellan is is like, like anybody. Um they get a reputation one way or the other. This guy was good. This guy was an idiot. This guy was bad. And that's just the way we think about him. Uh, when, you know, everybody has pluses and minuses. You know, we could criticize Sickles all you want, but Sickles is the guy who pushes legislation through in 1895 right, to right. turn Gettysburg the National Military. Yeah. So he's a better congressman than he is a general. Sure. Um, and I, I, I see McClellan the same way. Um, McClellan was a great organizer. That was his strength. Mm -hmm. um, he was brought to the army right before the Peninsula campaign. The Union Army was in disarray. You know what does he do? He brings them together. He organizes them. He puts together a great machine, and they advance up the Peninsula. Uh, the problem is, in 1862, um, the problem is uh, he doesn't like to see the thing he's created, uh, his creation, destroyed. Yeah, and so he's hesitant to commit the army in battle. Um, Antietam. You know, he attacks in stages, whereas if he'd attacked all at once, he could have overwhelmed the outnumbered Confederates. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing in the movie Gettysburg that, I, that General Lee addresses. There's a scene where he says, when you go into battle, uh, you must be willing mm. to destroy the thing that you love, the mm -hmm. army, meaning you've got to commit your troops. And, um, you know, McClellan would, um, would fight a battle. And then he'd turn around and he'd retreat and lick his wounds <laughs> before the next battle. And all that did was give the Confederates a chance to recoup their losses and prolong the war. And then, um, you know, they, they fired McClellan after the Peninsula campaign, and, and then they brought him back again uh, for the Antietam campaign. But he was very slow to pursue the Confederates after they retreated after the Antietam campaign, and it, it really bothered Lincoln. And, and Lincoln said when he found Grant and brought Grant uh, east and made him commander of all armies, he said, um, and, and people talked about Grant and his drinking, and is it a good idea to make him general in chief? And uh, Lincoln said something like, well, I, I can't afford to lose him. He fights. Yeah. And Lincoln also said he understands the arithmetic, which which meant that the Union would win a war of attrition. Mm -hmm. So Grant would commit the army, uh, the Overland cam campaign in, in uh, late April, early May of 1864, right after Gettysburg. Uh, he hits the Confederates in the in the wilderness. And he is rebuffed. But what does he do? He immediately doesn't stop and lick his wounds. He immediately goes around the Confederates and hits them against Pennsylvania. Right, right. And he did it at North End, and he did it at Cold Harbor. And, he, and what's happening? He's forcing the Confederates to retreat, and they're losing trips they can't afford to lose. Confederates go into a 10-month siege at Petersburg. That leads to Appomattox. He understands the arithmetic. Well, McClellan apparently he, did not no. understand the arithmetic. And he would delay and reform the army, and it would take all kinds of time. Um, McClellan was his worst, his own worst enemy. They, they called him the Little Napoleon. But um, there's a story of him, you guys have probably heard about this, where um, Lincoln came to his house to talk to him one night. This is the President of the United States, Commander oh, Chief. Yeah, yeah. You remember this, man? Yeah, oh, yeah. And um, they said, the servant said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. President, but uh, the general is out tonight. So Lincoln says, well, I'll wait. So Lincoln's in a parlor waiting for McClellan. McClellan comes back in. He doesn't see Lincoln. The servant says, well, you know, President's here to see you. <laughs> and McClellan says, well, I'll talk to him tomorrow. Goes up the steps and goes to bed <laughs> and completely burns the President yeah. of the United States yeah. off. And, um, now, you know, I think that hurt him later in the war. Was McClellan, of, uh, and just of the Army of the Potomac, was he the youngest commander of the Army of the Potomac? 
It seems like he probably was. Because he was, I think, 38, wasn't he? Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds now, right. Now, to me, when I heard that, um, it kind of blew my mind. Because that's, in my estimate, I mean, I know these guys were all pretty pretty young. But to be that's commanding the Army, and you're not even 40, it's... Well, it's Meade was, what, 47? Four, right. Here, get us. Yes. Uh, so to me, like, yeah, McClellan was, yeah. like McClellan's the 38 years old. Yeah. And I just and he just sounds like a like when I read his writings and stuff like like to his wife and stuff it just sounds like a pompous petulant arrogant little child. Well, I don't like him at all because I think he I think if he I mean what do I know but if, I feel like if he was a little more assertive with the army maybe more would have died in the short term but I think he might have not. The war might not have lasted as long. That's I, it exactly. I don't know. That, no, that's it exactly. Yeah? You yeah, think? that's what Grant understood. Yeah, if you commit to Army, you're going to get a lot of casualties, but you're going to win in the war earlier, which in the long run Correct. should be fewer casualties. Right, but Grant came in later when the war, when the armies had matured. Because, you know, like, especially when you read about the Army of the Potomac, it seems like they're kind of making it up as they go along. Like, they're learning on the job. They're figuring it all out. Um... Uh, and so when Grant comes along, you know, they've they they seem like they've gotten their act together prior to him coming. And then he just further now he knows how to use it and he knows how to pull everything together a little better than what they've been able to see because he's kind of coming from the outside in. Right. Um, and now he uses it as an effective weapon against the Confederacy. But right. I mean, so maybe if McClellan did have a pair early on. It would have still lasted four years. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it just you know when you read about it and you you, you know uh, just the, it's just a, it's sad. It's like a sad waste of life and time and everything. But it whatever, is. go ahead. You were trying to say something. No, you were right. Uh, you made some some great points there. Um, Grant learned from his experiences in the West, Vicksburg campaign. How many times does he try to capture Vicksburg? I think seven times. Yeah, he understands the value of persistence. You know, yeah, you can have setbacks, but just keep pounding. Um. I forgot what I was going to say. Well, but yeah, no. So you, Grant br- brings his McClellan didn't have that experience. I guess is where you were going. He didn't have. I mean, because he's yeah. earlier on in the war. And yeah, there was a battle somewhere like in Missouri or something. I think in the first year, and Grant was a lower level commander. And um, they said something about they were marching down the road toward the Confederates and how nervous they were and how apprehensive they were. And when they got to where they thought the Confederates were, they were gone. <laughs> and then Grant said, "That's when I learned." They're probably as afraid of us as we are. Right, them. right, right, right. Yes. You know, and then that leads to the, his successes at places like Donaldsville and uh, Fort, McK- uh, Fort Henry uh, in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, big success right after right after that. But um, yeah, McClellan was a great organizer, and when the army needed him to do that, uh, he was there. Right. So he served his purpose. The one time he was aggressive was the Antietam campaign. Right. But that's only because he found he Lee's found orders, orders and found that <laughs> Lee's army was divided into five yeah, pieces. Yeah. And then he's boldly marching towards South Mountain. You know, um, that's the one time you see him being aggressive. I like I love Grant though. I love his uh his whole attitude. I think I think Grant is a guy, no matter what your walk of life is, and you know, you you're faced with any kind of adversity or something, read about Grant. Yeah. And and in his attitude to, I mean, I love the, I think it's what, a Shiloh when, um, is after the first day and Sherman comes up to him, he says, you know, took a licking today and he says, yeah, whip him in the morning. Yep. Like just, okay, yeah. So, but tomorrow we're going to beat him. Oh, he said something about Lee one time. Uh, when I know. Came what east. It is. You think he's going to do uh, somersaults and, somersault <laughs> and land in our, our rear. Our rear. So why don't you go back to your tent and think about what we're going to do to him. Right. Um, right. And I remember it, it, that's the same period. That's the beginning of the Overland Campaign when he first joins the Army of Potomac. Now, what people don't realize is he was promoted to General in Chief, mm-hmm. which meant he, all his predecessors, like during Gettysburg, it was Henry Halleck. These guys are not in the field. They're in the offices. They're in the War Department. Yeah. And they are receiving telegrams and they're sending orders out. So they're in between Lincoln and the commanders in the field. He's right. the overall. Grant chose to travel with the Army of the Potomac after Gettysburg uh, to act as a buffer between Washington and, and that's why Reynolds turned the command down. He didn't want that political interference. And um, he's heard a lot about Meade, uh, that Meade was slow to, to follow the Confederates after Gettysburg, which is nonsense. Um, and that, you know, he wasn't that great a commander, which just is not true. But um, so he'd been fed all this bad information. 
And he meets Meade uh, somewhere near the wilderness in May of 64. And Meade walks up to Grant and offers to resign <laughs> to make it easy for Grant. And it threw Grant completely off balance. He didn't expect that at all. He said, no, I want you to remain. And, uh, and that so says something he, about Grant. Yeah. says something about Meade. Sure. Oh uh, yeah, no, and, and I like Mead too. I know you love Mead, and uh, don't don't criticize Mead in front of Jim because he will go nuts. <laughs> well, you can criticize him if you want to. Um, he was just what the Union Army needed at at this time. Yeah. Um, the thing that I get mad about is when people say he didn't pursue the Confederates. Uh, me too. In a timely manner, that's what I get yeah. mad about. Mead. Mead, Mead has his faults too. Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, that's what I get mad about because we know that he did. And it's just not fair to me. No. That's why I get upset. Well, it's not fair to... I mean... Because uh, I get in this with my father all the time. When we t- when he comes down here, we drive around. He goes, oh, I still can't believe it didn't chase him. You know? And I'm like, Dad, you're like... You're doing movie history. Like, there's so much more to it. There's not... It's not just like the Confederates were licked and the Yankees were sitting there buffing their nails. Like, <laughs> they... They're, you know, they were just as tired and beaten and, you know, well, why couldn't they send the cavalry? Well, uh, they did. They did. Yeah. But what the hell does that do? Yeah. We were just talking on the last episode with Tim. He doesn't, he's not, a, he's not a big fan of cavalry. And so, so he, uh, <clears throat> he kept pointing out all these things. He goes, you know, uh, Kilpatrick took uh, Monterey Pass and he goes, and then the Confederates showed up and he left. <laughs> like, what's the point of taking it? So, uh, all right. One more thing here. The great Trinetti asks, uh, this kid's great. He's always thinking he really loves his Civil War history. And uh, so I want to answer all the questions he sends in. Um, <clears throat> what batteries on both sides were involved in the fight on Benner's Hill and uh, what their role was? I don't know what he means by that. What were the batteries uh, that you could recall? I mean, maybe not. Let's not. Let's do battalions. Can we do battalions and brigades? I could have done that. When I got this question last night, it was at the bottom of the list, and it was getting pretty late, and I was getting pretty tired. I went, oh, no, this is the one that I'm not going to be able to talk about off the top of my head. Right. So I had to go get some, do some research on it. Um, as far as the role goes, uh, as far as the Confederate artillery goes, it was... It was uh, two things. Uh, one, it was to help support Longstreet's attack on the other end of the Union line. So that artillery, that Confederate artillery is on the far Confederate left. Right. Longstreet's going to attack on the right opposite the Union left, down where all the famous landmarks are. Big Round Top, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, Peach Orchard. We've We're talking day two. Day two. So the plan was to make it look like a demonstration on the Union right at Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill by the Confederate left up on Benner's Hill. By doing that... Um, you force the Union Army to keep troops on their right, keep them away from the left where the main assault by Longstreet's going to begin on the Confederate right. That's one thing. And then the other thing was to support uh, the Confederate demonstration that did turn into an attack uh, on the Union right on the night of the second by Johnson's division. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was able to get some names of batteries and so forth. Um, the battalion that was on better self from the Confederate side is Latimer's battalion. Okay, maybe we should define the term. Sure, Okay, let's do that. Um, a single cannon is a gun. Right. Two cannons is a section. Mm-hmm. Usually a gun is commanded by a sergeant, a section is commanded by a lieutenant, and a battery is about four to six cannons. And that's commanded usually by a lieutenant or captain. a captain. Now wait, so uh, Confederate Army, it's usually four. Union Army, it's usually six. Is usually, that, uh, that that's typically I, yeah. how it there works? There are exceptions yeah. to that, but that's generally how it works. Okay. So if you take four batteries of four guns each, you form a battalion of 16, and it's usually commanded by like a major. Okay. And uh, the interesting thing about this question, and Benner's Hill and the Confederate artillery, is that Major Latimer charges the battalion, 16 guns, 19 years old. Yeah. He's the Confederate version of... um, McClellan. uh, No, no. um, Baird Wilkerson. Oh, okay. Okay. Who, you know, performed the amputation on his own sure. leg when he was, was hit. Yep. 19 years old, also battalion commander, uh, which is pretty impressive. But that would have been a brigade, right, in the Union Army? Yeah, see, that's the confusing thing, because you have battalions which also apply to infantry, right. in some cases in the Civil War, but are also referring to artillery on both sides right. here at Gettysburg. Now, I remember one time when I was first learning about all this stuff, I just looked in the dictionary for the term battalion. And the the generic, like, non-military term battalion is, is that it's really just an organization of men. Like, it doesn't give a specific number. It doesn't say made up of companies. It doesn't say half of a regiment or anything like that. It's, it's just, it's more of, it's a battle group. 
It's bigger than a company. It's well, of course, it's not yeah. as big as a regiment. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. So I, I think because you know, go, like uh, like words like legion is another one. Yeah, that's you know, you, you have uh, a couple of uh, units that call themselves a legion, like Hamptons Legion, right? It was the Hamptons Phillips Legion, Legion. Cobb Cobb Legion. Legion. yeah, Cobb. yeah. Um, But but are, are they technically a legion? Because I think a legion meant a certain number of men. Sometimes a or legion something like that could actually involve all, all three of the major branches: cavalry, artillery, and and infantry. Which was, and a lot of times they were privately funded. So like Phillips or or Cobb or or uh, right. or, or Hampton would actually fund it. That whole uh, that whole notion of a legion actually yes. goes back to like Roman times, right? Well, no, that we're talking about the composition of the American legions after. Uh, this is in the 1790s. Oh, okay. So, like around the Whiskey Rebellion time period, where a legion was actually what we'd call today combined arms, where you had infantry, cavalry, and artillery within the same organization. And if I remember correctly, Hampton's Legion was actually made up like that when they were recruited. Uh, they have formed as infantry, artillery, and cavalry all together. Oh, okay. I think that's where that comes from. That's interesting. Okay, so I, I just went and, and Googled it here. Um, the the term is, it's originally it means three to 6,000 troops in the ancient Roman army. That's, that's where big. it comes from. That's, that's big. That's a lot yeah. bigger, bigger than what we had here. Now, now we kind of use it as to mean a vast host or multitude or number of people or things. Um, but of course, and then every country too, every country has kind of a slightly definition, a different definition of each of these terms and, you know, but anyway, so civil war though, 1863 artillery, Confederates call them battalions and those are four batteries, right? Yes. And then union calls them a brigade. Is that also That's four bra- batteries or pretty much, pretty much, pretty much all battalions or, or brigades and artillery your side were about 16 guns okay so go ahead you were you you had your notes well um on the union side the you know uh, the problem with Benner's Hill artillery is it was out in an open plain and the union army was able to bombard it from two locations mm-hmm. east cemetery hill and Culp's Hill, uh concentrating their fire in one location whereas the confederates had to disperse their fire and the confederates got the worst of it but uh, the artillery that was up on east cemetery hill under howard was commanded by a guy named osborne uh. and he had about Ten guns there that he used against uh, Benner's Hill. Um, the Confederate batteries up there, since we were asked, were uh, commanded by Captain Rain, C.I. Rain, the Lee Battery. That's R-A-I-N-E. Uh, the Rockbridge Artillery. The Chesapeake Artillery, which was Maryland guys. The Rain Battery was Virginia guys. That was William Brown, Captain William Brown. Um, Captain DeMent had a, ba- a Maryland battery up there. And J.C. Carpenter had the Allegheny Artillery up there. And I think there was a Kilpatrick battery that was across the north side of the Hanover Road, opposite what we call Benner Hills Hill Day, with some still guns up there. What um, a Kilpatrick, Kirkpatrick, Union, Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick, oh, Kirkpatrick, Kirkpatrick, okay. Kirkpatrick, and it was uh, it was a battery commander. You can see the battery tablet up there on the north side of Hanover Road up at, uh, at Benner's Hill. Oh yeah, well, well there's another battalion over there, wasn't right. there? Yeah, well, a lot of, and a lot of people don't go there. They just no. take the road because there's no pavement. Right, so you have to kind of park your car and then walk across. Well, it's the like road. playing Frogger trying to get across that road. It is, Matt. It's dangerous. <laughs> I, know. But, I know, but it's worth it. <laughs> Because there's something you'll see over there that you only see on one other part. Of the, you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking Go about. Go ahead and hit, hit It's me. the pile of balls. That's it. The yeah. pyramid of cannonballs. Yep, yep. You'll see them at the angle, at the cops of trees. And the only other place in the battlefield I know of where they, and they, I guess they're there because they're, because nobody goes, goes there, there yeah. and you can't see them no. until you actually go across the road and over the ridge. And then you can, you can see them very few people. For do. a while we thought that maybe the, the park service forgot they were there, but they mow there. So they have yeah. to know they're there. They just, I, I, I wonder why <laughs> some, like, it seems like, okay. The park service at one point in time said, you know what? Let's get rid of these pyramids. Okay. Uh, kind of. Let's not. We'll forget about those. Leave those. Doesn't matter. Like, why do it half ass? Like, just Be- because those are aren't seen and they're yeah, less I, likely to get vandalized and stolen. Okay. So All I think right. the park is happy to keep them. You know, have them in a place where people can see what they used to look like. Yeah. But not have them all over the battlefield. No. Same way you know in the cemetery. You know, between the state plots coming from the Soldiers National Monument, there used to be like a starburst, like on my ring. It was sidewalks that dis- divided all the state plots. Today there's only one. It divides the New York and Pennsylvania plot. You know why it's there? Uh, well, yeah. they took them out because of mowing. Okay. You know, modern mowing equipment going over pavement, not good. Mm, yeah. So they took them out, but they left that one sidewalk. So that we could access So we could it. see what it looked like. We could see what oh, the, all okay. the others. They left one. 
So you can see what they were, all the ones that were there oh, that came out. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. They used to be all of them. They took them out because it was difficult to mow, but they left that one sidewalk. Huh. It runs from the Soldiers National Monument down toward the sidewalk, yeah. down toward the stone wall, toward the annex. Right, where the, like, the World War II guys mm-hmm. are. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Okay. I, I didn't know that there were walkways there. I got to yeah, learn more about one. the cemetery. Just one. No, no, no. But I'm saying that there. Oh, both, yeah. There at one time there was yeah, more than one. They looked like my ring. Yeah. They all went out like a and raised from the center. Huh. Pretty That's cool. That's pretty huh? cool. Yeah. Okay. So you have more. Uh, the Union batteries on uh, East Cemetery Hill were under Reynolds and Cooper, Pennsylvania units, I think. And Stevens Battery, Stevens Knoll, is named after the Fifth Main uh, Battery uh, uh, Union. Uh, that were involved in that. Stevens so Battery. Stevens Battery, named after Stevens. So uh, those were the Union units that uh, were involved in the uh, artillery duel that the Confederates got the worst of up to. Yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, real quick, just let everybody know what happened to Latimer's Battalion, then we'll wrap up. Um, they had to withdraw a lot of the guns from that open ridge. They had to move a lot of them across to the north side of um, uh, Hanover Road out of range because they were taking the worst of it from East Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. And uh, they left, a f- uh, I think they took the 10-pounder Parrot's uh, the more valuable guns at that time and, and and they were greater range so they moved them a little bit further away uh, no actually I could be wrong with that they might I think it was the, the parents actually that they left there and when you go to the end of Benner's uh, hill to the to the cul-de-sac where you turn around right. you can still see a couple of 10 pounders on display yeah 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 the those are the parrots there yeah, yeah that was rain's battery i'm pretty sure so uh-huh. yeah i think they actually left some of the 10 pounders there and moved some of napoleon's way because they were not at that range they weren't real effective and some of the um the horses got so the teams got so mangled up that they had to use some of the same teams to pull off the different like pull a gun off unhitch and then go and get another gun and bring it back because they were low on horses and there's and I know I'm not going to do it justice but there's this really great quote I read um, from a guy who's describing it all and I guess you know this one team was just mostly and when I say team I mean like group of horses uh, was mostly just down like dead or, or wounded but the wounded horses were flailing around and getting all jumbled up in the the reins and the harnesses and everything. And the men who were the, what do you call them? The teamsters, not teamsters, yeah. but uh, well, the wagon drivers. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. The driver, the guys who were with the horses. Yeah. Um, well, they're getting tangled up in that mess too. And other guys had to come over and shoot the horses in the head in order to stop them from bashing in some guys' brains with their hooves. Like it's, you know, movies don't show any of this stuff because I don't know why, but I mean, I think if any movie ever really like showed this, you would never, I think that's how you would end wars. You just show people how horrible it is because it's also, you know, it's not just people that's getting destroyed. It's, it's animals that have nothing to do with this. They have no dog in the fight. And uh, that's what sucks about it all. All right. Um, anything else to add to that? Um, Ladder Murr himself, the battalion commander, 19 years old, he was mortally wounded up there, and they took him back to Virginia. He died, uh, I think, at Harrisonburg about um, about a month later. Yeah, he's buried in uh, Woodbine Cemetery, Harrisonburg, Virginia. Today, I'll just leave it with this: this is kind of a private thing I don't generally share. Okay, but because we brought up Benners Hill, it's one of my favorite places to go. And if you've never done this, you might want to go up there sometime at night. Oh yeah, uh, because Benners Hill is east of Gettysburg, and it sits up higher. So when you're along that road that crests that ridge, and you stop. You can look down at the lights of Gettysburg, and they they appear kind of amber, and it's a totally different perspective of Gettysburg. Yeah. Looking down, it kind of reminds me of probably being like in Mulholland, looking down at Los Angeles, <laughs> but in a smaller scale. Right. And it's it's there's very few people ever go up there, so you probably won't be bothered by too many people. And yeah. It's just it's just a really neat place at night, like when it first starts to get dark. To look down at the town of Gettysburg, I don't know of any other view like it. No, I uh, that is also one of my favorite places to go because a there's nobody there, b I love the not only the view of the town, but then you can see uh, the peace light beyond the town, and my favorite thing, and this is really uh, really best done during the summer when a storm is coming from the west you go out there and you watch it approach you watch it you know uh, engulf the mountains and you watch it just come across and then sooner or later you can't see the town 
because it's now it's raining on the town and you just wait until it gets to you and then you get in your car and you sit there and, or drive away or whatever. But when that storm comes in, especially late in the day, sunset, when that sun is skimming down across at an angle, you get some really pretty colors out there. Oh, <laughs> you do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But um, I've seen that same view, Matt, uh, doing bike tours on Little Round Top. Yep. And you see it coming. And you get the hell back. <laughs> you know, you're probably going to end up being wet by yeah. the end of yeah. the tour. Oh, yeah. By the time you get to the angle, you're going to be wet, <laughs> which is probably welcome by that point anyway because everybody's so hot right so yep. it's like but no you touched on something else that, that, that's really neat uh, a lot of people discover this about Gettysburg um, it, when you get some days with a little bit of clouds it, it, it's, it's, it is a great view from, oh. from looking towards South Mountain to, to see the sunset uh, you get some incredible sunsets yeah. from there so yeah, I'm sure you get the same thing from Benner's Hill you do You're looking west from Little Round Top or Benner's Hill, uh, if you get a little bit of cloud cover late in the evening, uh, it's one of the beautiful parts of Gettysburg. It's definitely it's definitely better, I think, uh, from Little Round Top. But yeah, Benner's maybe. Hill is I, I find it to be a little more interesting because you know Little Round Top you're seeing for miles and miles and miles. Uh, Benner's Hill. You're still seeing for miles and miles and miles, but it's it's not an unobstructed view. So you got the town in the way, and then you have Seminary Ridge. And so beyond Seminary Ridge, the only thing you can see are the mountains. You can't see the ground between Seminary Ridge and the mountains. So it's different. It's a different view. You're not seeing as much. Um, but either way, I mean, honestly, you can't go wrong here. If you're looking for sunsets, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot go wrong coming to Gettysburg and just opening your eyes at sunset time, and you'll see something pretty. All right. <clears throat> Greg Cernetti, great question there. And uh, thank you, Jim, for coming in. You're welcome, Greg. Great it was to uh, great, to, great to have you. And we'll get you out in time just for your bus. Thank you. And uh, that's it, Eric. Thanks for chiming in before as well. Yep, thanks, and Eric. thank you all for listening. Keep your questions coming in if you want to hear or if you want to take a tour with any of these guides that you hear on the show. Matt at AddressingGettysburg.com. And I will put you in touch with them. And uh, you guys can take it from there and hopefully uh, work something out. So. So until next time, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Let the lucky sons be not dismayed, but join with me, each show your play. Boots and sing and lend your aid to help me with the chorus. Instead of spawn, we'll drink down there and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for dead shall go to jail from here and go. The wheels break the doors, the watch knocked down by threes and fours, then let the doctors work their cures and tinker up our bruises. Instead of spa, we'll drink down hell and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for death shall go to jail from there and go to So have got us fame For soon tis known from whence we came Wherever we go they dread the name Of Gary Owen and Glory Instead of spawn we'll drink down hell And pay the reckoning on the nail No man for death shall go to jail From Gary Owen and Glory Instead of spawn we'll drink down hell And pay the reckoning on the nail No man for death shall go to jail From Gary Owen and Glory